next, Ernest Klein joins the ranks of Leo Tolstoy, Jane Austen, and William Shakespeare as he enters the virtual reality world that is the Booking. special I love the 80s edition of the booking today all you culture cool. club 1984 that's right <laughs> all right Jake, let's, let's see if you can do this one joining us today we've got Brandon just wants to have fun Cindy Lauper 1985 that's all I want it's just when the work <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Did you really get the year on that? I made an educated guess, and I'm going to verify. What did you say? 85. 85. Let's find out. Oh, bated breath. (laughs) Bated breath. (laughs) (laughs) We're all waiting with bated breath. I bet you you the bard came up with that one. Yeah, he probably did. Sounds like a bard to me. By the bard, of course, we're referring to Ernest Cline. Oh, yeah. He's taking (laughs) taking the title. He's a slam poet. (laughs) Fail. Fail. What what year did he come out? 82. 83. Oh. Carmen Chameleon, what did you say for that? 84? 84. That sounds right. I think it's right. I'm going to do a Price is Right and say 85, the year of my birth. 83. 83. I Price has wronged it. And of course, the person that I'm speaking to uh, of... I, I, I think I recently looked at a list of you know, <laughs> top songs in 1984, and that's how I... Culture, or uh, Karma Chameleon was, so you, yeah, actually was knew, you knew it was on the charts. Of, yeah, I knew it was on the chart in 84. Oh, for the Sound of uh, Sanity, sound of where sanity. we talked about the 80s and the year yeah. of your birth, the great year of your birth, of course, 84. That's and right, you yeah. are... Let's see if you can do this one. Jake on, Take on me. me. Uh, I'll be gone in a mantle or two. I'm going to say 86. Who's it by? Aha. Uh-huh. I think. I feel so uh, stupid, guys. <laughs> I don't know wait, these wait, 80s wait, references. What year did you say? Uh, I'm going to say 86. 85. 85. My grandparents owned an Atari. <laughs> Uh, my, <laughs> back in the olden days, <laughs> all we had was Atari. <laughs> the Atari man would come up in his carriage and bring a new cartridge round every year. That's right. That's exactly how it happens. <laughs> and set your cartridge on the uh, yeah. back step in a... <laughs> yeah. <just> come by. <laughs> okay. You refill the cartridge. That's what you did back then. You refill. Yeah, yeah, you refilled you it. You refilled the different... cartridge. The cartridge man would come around. Yeah. You'd refill your cartridge. You'd take out the old tape, put in the new. I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes Ma would leave a pie on the windowsill, cooling for the cartridge man when he came, huh? he came by. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why I think You guys are doing so great. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very elaborate way of making fun of Brandon. It's about hey, I'm Nathan Alberson. I didn't actually come up with a song for me. What Nathan about 80s? a little ditty about Jack and Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. Here, Jake, why don't you help us do some '80s shoutouts? '80s '80s shoutouts. '80s. Yeah, J- Jake's gonna have to do this one. Brandon, I'm Whatever. just gonna say their name. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, Brandon's in a bad mood because we're talking about a book that he if people can't tell. <laughs> oh, I got one. What's that? The Nathan Zone. <laughs> I'll take you right into the <laughs> Nathan, Nathan zone. zone. Jake, if you wanted to have a donor shout out, what would you have to do? Uh, you'd have to give $10 or more on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the booking. That is absolutely right. Get access to free, great behind the scenes content. Yeah. We post a video every week, folks. Except we for- get to see some of the sources Brandon uses for his context That's and right. uh, get a preview of how we're feeling. Maybe, maybe, or maybe not a little more honest look at what. <laughs> <laughs> I would say definitely get a little more honest look. Our patrons know us better because they get to yeah. see us. 
unfiltered. That's Actually, right. It's still filtered. Sometimes I cut things out of those videos or just don't <clears throat> use the videos that have things that you don't need to know about us. But that's okay. Andrew and Esther want to rule the world. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> there you go. Yay. <laughs> All right, Brandon. <laughs> mm-hmm. Tie this one into an 80s reference. Hmm. I like grumpy Brandon. Um, <laughs> the inscrutable Jenny Z. The inscrutable Jenny Z phone home. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Jake, you've got yourself some Robert and Rhonda. Ooh, what's happened to my voice? It's full of phlegm. <clears throat> Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds. Robert and Rhonda are made of these. <laughs> <laughs> Robert and Rhonda are made of these. Brandon? Yeah. Give us some 80s. John and Jill and Baby Max, the lovebirds. Baby Max, Jill is your mother and John is your father. <laughs> <laughs> That's a 70s reference. Oh, whatever. <laughs> what, The Empire Strikes Back? Yeah. Is really early 80s, I think. <sighs> Good. Like maybe 1980. Yeah, I mean, it's Good. Like, well, I, I got it. It, it still counts. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, it counts just barely. I do my beloved mother, Beth, Jake. You spin me right round, Beth, right <laughs> round. <laughs> Brandon, um, uh-huh. give us some Maya. Maya, <laughs> you're going to need a bigger boat. That's definitely 70s. <laughs> That's definitely 70s. <laughs> uh, Jay and Katie, who are cold and love cheese. Um, another one eats the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> another one eats the cheese. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Although, what's love got to do with it? Brandon? Yeah. Let me see here. Why don't you do an 80s reference for Benjamin Tiberius? <laughs> Walk like a Benjamin. They walk like a Benjamin. <laughs> Jake's just going to feed these to me. <laughs> Nathan, not me. Get your... Uh, hey, uh, Nathan, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blow my mind. Hey, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I love it. All right. Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. His hey, little me? ditty oh, about yeah. Eric and Catherine. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Little that's ditty just... about Eric and Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Professor X. Neun and neun sick Professor Axis. <laughs> I don't even know what you're... 99 oh. red balloons. Neun and neun sick luft balloons. Neun and neun sick Professor X. Yeah, that's, not very good. That's, not, no. that's, not, that's not good. I love Professor X. Put another dime in the jukebox, baby. <laughs> Who you gonna call? Professor, Professor X. X. I love it. Okay. Well, thank you for supporting us. Jake, can you summarize this book for us? Uh, yeah, I would summarize it as uh, Willy Wonka meets the Matrix. Willy Wonka meets the Matrix. <laughs> it's funny. The USA Today said something very similar. <laughs> I know. I they said fun it was of it. <laughs> enchanting. <laughs> I'm not sure I would say that. <laughs> what's the conceit of this book? People might be curious. Maybe some people haven't heard of it. What's the? What's the? It's a science fiction novel. The conceit of this book is Steve Jobs slash Willy Wonka sometime in a post-apocalyptic future where everybody's poor and they live in trailers stacked upon trailers and they have no money and no way to escape. They escape into a virtual reality created by this Steve Jobs, Willy Wonka character. He died a trillionaire and he left this virtual reality world called the Oasis to the person who can find the Easter egg in his world and he left a series of clues behind. A bunch of individuals are after it and there's an evil corporation that has formed a massive team that is going to try to find it and do a hostile takeover and charge everybody. Our hero has to find his way to the Easter egg and save the oasis and save the world. But the cool fun conceit about the book is that it combines all pop culture from all time. So you can go to the Star Wars when you're in the Oasis, virtually out. You can world. go to Middle Earth. You go to Middle Earth, go to the you Star Wars to world, the, go the to Austin the Austin verse. The Austin verse. And, yeah. yeah. And so you can outfit your X Wing with your things that you got from the Mad Max world that you got with and you drive around with your avatar of Ali Sheedy from the Breakfast Club. And it's just like it's that kind of thing. Yeah. But it really hones in on 80s pop culture because the this creator was an 80s pop culture aficionado and obsessive. And so... And by this creator, you mean both the guy in the book and the guy that wrote the book. That that's right. That is obviously cashing in on 80s nostalgia. The world builder and the world builder. Mm-hmm. What's that sound? Brandon has guns, which he's firing off right now in his classic segment, The Contextual Texan. Yeah. Ah. Brandon... You're, you, what you are is you're a Texan, you're from Texas, yeah. and you provide some much-needed context generally on our work. <laughs> and you could not be more excited. You're pleased as punch to receive to provide some context on the great... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so take it away. Talking about Ready Player One by yeah, Ernest so, Klein. So what I did 
as I underlined every reference in the book, <laughs> and I went and I looked up what it was referencing. All right. And so we're going to just talk about every single reference Let's in do this it. book. And that's we'll gonna see be... you guys in yeah. Uh, December. Yeah, so... <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so... No, we're not no. doing that. <laughs> we're going to find out le- later whether Brandon's a fan of this book. In fact, to teach some to folks, we are going to put this book on trial. I think probably next episode, we're going to put this book on trial. Brandon's going to be the witness for the... No, he's going to be the prosecuting attorney. Jake's going to be the defense attorney. be the attorney. executing attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon's going to ask for the death penalty, I think, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one. I'd like to begin by reading two quotes from Ernest Klein. All right. Because I think they'll help. Imagining the future is dangerous because it can go either way. Nostalgia is good like video games or music or movies because it is escapism. Uh, that last, that the first quote I just thought, found funny because I have no clue what he means. But um, that second quote actually kind of gets at what I think is the big issue with me with this book. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so we always start with biographies. Yeah, always. <laughs> so let's do it. We've got our rhythm, so why not keep that rhythm, huh? Uh-huh. Um, he was born in Ashland, Ohio in 1972. There aren't many biographies written on this guy yet. <laughs> <laughs> <Are they not? laughs> I haven't written the definitive biography on this dude yet. Why His not? Wikipedia page is fairly slim, and so you have to go to all these, dare I say, sludge through all these interviews that he has given, and most of them are surra- surround publication of his novel Armada. But you find out some interesting things about the guy when you do this. And so apparently he and his brother were born to, he has one older brother, they were born to teenage parents and were then given to their grandparents and were raised by their grandparents. His father abandoned him, his mother abandoned him, and he was raised by his grandparents. This is what we know this for sure. He doesn't have really bad associations with being raised by his grandparents. He thinks that he's, here, I've got a quote from him here. He's extremely grateful for the non-traditional upbringing they gave us, because I think it instilled us both with a strong sense of self-reliance, which I think has probably played a key role in both my and my brother's success. And so, grandmother, did have some influence in his life, though. She hated video games. She said the video games would rot his brain. And she also hated Dungeons and Dragons. Very religious. And so she got a hold of one of those books that was really popular in the 80s about how Dungeons and Dragons was actually teaching kids, kids how to do witchcraft. Yeah, I remember. Right? So this was a big thing. Like, it was really scary back yeah, then. And it scary even, Dungeons yeah, Dungeons. it even carried over into the 90s. Yeah. That um, So Dungeons and Dragons, interesting fact. I don't know if anybody or any younger people would even know this, but Dungeons and Dragons had a whole, especially in like the Baptist circles. Maybe it was non-Baptist circles too, but that's how I grew up. But We, we would have been more it. charismatic, but Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. it was just an accepted fact of my early life that it was an evil, satanic, Yeah, it was satanic, and thing. it was a way that you could worship the devil and enter into devil worship and sacrifice and witchcraft and mm-hmm. all these things. And so Ernest Klein's grandmother believed this. It, it made Dungeons and Dragons kind of a secret thing for him. And he has this one quote from an interview where he said, you know, he would, he felt like when he would put his Dungeons and Dragons cards under his coat while he was sneaking out of the house, he felt like he was like carrying out some heavy metal album or something. He was really cool for doing it. So he was born in the 70s, surrounded by the pop culture. He says that this is heavily influential for why he was able to write the novels or even want to write the novels that he wrote later in his life. When was Star Wars? I'm asking this. When was Star Wars? 77. 77. That's when Star Wars came out. So he was five years old when Star Wars came out. And he has an early memory of going to see Star Wars at the theater. And then as soon as Star Wars was over, going to play, what's the famous one? The one where you have the, uh, you're trying to shoot the Pog, aliens Pord, that are falling uh, onto the... Galaga? Yeah, maybe it's Galaga. Asteroid. I don't know. Something like that. So, but in his mind, then you had this pop cultural point. moment of Star Wars and also video games in their earliest form were just melded into his mind. Mm. And so this would become the big nostalgia point. And I've I've mentioned how a whole lot of authors' childhoods really influence what they write later in life. But it's true. His nostalgia is heavily influential in what he would write later in his life. Um, wasn't a highly successful student, but he, he did do well in his English classes, so he says. But he never got anything published, wasn't a really successful young writer. And so then he would move, eventually ended up in Austin, and he became a part of what we is called, apparently, a poetry slam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm trying not to sound so disdainful. I'm going to try not to sound like I am just hate everything right now. So, neutral journalistic branded <laughs> right now. <laughs> a poetry slam <laughs> is, where, is where they get up on stage and you improvise poetry. Yeah, in competition. But usually it's going to be more rap-style poetry. And from what I can tell, rap has that in the bag. So I don't really know the place of slam poetry other than it seems like a bunch of white people who get up on stage and do. 
it's people who can't, who don't want to write serious poetry, people who can't be rappers. And so they do poetry slams, slam poets. That's where he met his wife. If you join the Patreon, you'll hear me read some of his poetry. But I was looking, I, I looked up some of his poems because mm-hmm. I don't know why I did it, but I did. I went deep down this rabbit hole. <laughs> um, That's why we love you, Brandon. <laughs> and boy, this might be why I hate him so much. Quality works of literature. It's bad stuff. And actually, it's pretty nasty stuff too. Um, you better give a sample to our, even to our non-Patreon. Well, so... There's a certain kind of, uh, what are they called? A certain kind of guy who goes and he reads Nietzsche and he reads Schopenhauer and he thinks he's the smartest thing ever. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and he sits in the Briar and the Burley. I'm actually thinking of a guy right now. He's a yeah. philosophy grad student. Right. Who I don't think will ever graduate from grad school. He, he just loves being a grad student. So he can sit in there, smoke his cigar and tell everybody he's read Nietzsche and Schopenhauer throw out some quotes from Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. Brian Burley, folks, is a tobacco yeah. shop here in town. Yeah, so translate that. It's a smoke room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so translate that into someone who knows, hasn't just watched Star Wars, but they know all like the arcana of Star the Wars. Minutia. All the arcana of video games. And you get the same kind of person. Really self-involved, most likely very self-conscious, awkward person who kind of hates everybody, feels socially awkward feels like they deserve more cred than they're given and doesn't realize that it's their personality that's keeping them from ever being credible to anyone. Yeah, and so there are, I mean, so then we get this poem about he thinks he's being so I I wrote here. This was my note about it. I then I went and I printed the poem. Dance monkey dance about how we are monkeys. Deep stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's your note. <laughs> that's my note. <laughs> and so he's got such uh, gems as you see the monkeys fill alone, all six billion of them. Monkeys don't want to be monkeys. They want to be something else, but they're not. And of course, the whole poem is just about how people are monkeys, but we have all these aspirations, but we also have all these horrible things that we do. And we want to be monkeys, but we're not, can't not stop being monkeys. We're just monkeys. And so get over it. You know, we're monkeys. And like, this is really deep. He's got this poem where he um, is talking about his kind of pornography. It's a poem. Mm-hmm. And he says he doesn't like the regular pornography because that's for like male machismo guys mm-hmm. who want, you know, don't like the women he likes, mm-hmm. but he wants like a librarian uh-huh, and yeah. he wishes that could be yeah, pornography. Yeah, and so he yeah. thinks he's, it's just really, really gross cool. stuff. And in some ways I felt happy that I went far enough down the rabbit hole to find this right? because it like, this was the Easter egg. <laughs> It unwrapped everything that I thought about this guy. The Easter egg of hatred. Yeah, is... it, it it validated every single bad feeling I had towards mm. this guy. I found it. It's like, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Ernest Klein had hid this Easter egg deep in his life, and here it was on some Reddit thread, <laughs> this poem that he wrote. <laughs> and so there, that's Ernest Klein for you. He published this chat book in 2001, and it was a, a poems, and he called it The Importance of Being Earnest. Now hold on, Brandon. Yeah, Nathan. Before you go any further. Uh-huh. Are we just going to be a bunch of crotchety, cynical jerks about this book? I don't think so, Nathan. <laughs> I think Brandon might be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I'm not. I'm, not. Uh, so, so I'm just going to give... I just want to say, spoiler alert, there are people in this room that did not hate this book. Brandon may not be one of those people. I may be in the minority here. I'm not going to say that I loved the book, but... I don't want anybody to turn off the episode because you think you know what we're going to say and you think we're just going to be crotchety and cynical and have fun tearing it apart. And because the guy who's in the minority gets pretty much the whole episode to just be a grump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's going to give you lots of good information that you need. And we were just really nasty to Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to the Wrinkle in Time movie. And now we're coming into Ready Player One with a nasty tone. I'm going to reserve my opinion. I'm going to hold it in suspense. And we don't really know what Brandon thinks, but, but, but it's possible. We he don't. It's possible but I loved shut it. Shut up. You enjoyed it, Nathan. Uh, maybe. It's possible. You guys pick. can like it. You guys can like it. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, can we agree, though, that, Jake, that n- young nerds that read Schopenhauer <laughs> yes. and uh, yes. Nietzsche and- <laughs> They're the worst. Uh, they're the worst. I, as he was giving that bit of context, I was sitting there just thinking about what I was actually thinking about are- Forgive me if you're listening, because you might actually be listening. But I was thinking about I was thinking about the nerds from high school, mm-hmm. and they're exactly the kind of guys both that think Ernest Klein and Ready Player One's the greatest, and may have played Dungeons. Dra- but I, by the way, did it, didn't even know that Dungeons and Dragons was a thing until later in life. But then also think that they, you know, because they read an article in a leftist magazine, know something about politics, and because they've heard of Nietzsche and maybe have read Nietzsche, they 
you know, get life. Yeah, they probably read like a yeah. chapter from Thus Spake Zarathustra so, and maybe like an introduction to some Schopenhauer. That's I love Schopenhauer because that's I read it. Listen, folks, I was that guy. Come on, I'm not. I I know I'm not making fun of myself too here. I'm not just being a jerk. Yeah. Those those people are pretty silly. So I think people need to know that I actually. I mean, I sat down and I pretty much read this book in one day. Mm-hmm. It's entertaining. As did I, and I was it definitely draws you in. It engages you. Something in it interested me. Mm-hmm. I read the whole thing. But now I've spent a lot of time digesting it, but then also doing all this outside reading and stuff. And a lot of my feelings right now have to do with the fact that I do take the author seriously, as everybody knows, controversial opinion. Mm-hmm. I take the author seriously. I read a lot about this guy, and I- You just didn't like him. I kind of despise him. <laughs> So that's right. where I'm coming from. Yeah. My sourness is not necessarily the book. It's Ernest Klein. Right. But so if anybody is afraid we're just going to spend the next two episodes taking cheap shots at this book, we're going to take expensive shots yeah. at this book. Let's take some expensive Maybe shots. we'll take some cheap shots too. Maybe we already have. But all right, Brandon, continue with your context. His first fanfic script, we'll talk about fanfic in a little bit. Mm-hmm was called Fanboys, which actually doesn't sound like a bad movie. It sounds fairly fun. It's about this guy. It's A lot of his movies actually are slightly tongue-in-cheek towards his culture, mm-hmm. which I don't know really what to think about that. So Fanboys is about this one guy who's obsessed with his culture. He's dying, and what he really wants is to go to George Lucas's ranch to see the script for episode one, Star Wars. Mm-hmm. This was before episode yeah. one and come out. Yeah, and so the, the whole movie is about the whole trying grail. to get there. Yeah. yeah. And so George Lucas agreed to it and stuff, and it got public. It got made into a movie in 2009. I remember when that script was going around, it was a big deal on the internet. All the nerds were talking about, like, this is just a script that gets us. This is so cool. Like, it was, yeah. a, it was one of those things in, in the nerd communities that I was a part of around that time that... It was, I'm just going to use Ernest Klein language. It was like the holy grail of cool nerd. I think when the movie was actually made, I don't know if there was like studio interference. I remember the movie didn't turn out being as good as people wanted it to be. But I remember the movie. From what I read in interviews, yeah, it was a lot of studio interference. It was actually Kevin Spacey's studio. Really? Ended up uh, producing it, yeah. So the guy can, in other words, he can kind of uh, make fun of himself. Sure. From what I understand with this movie. I didn't watch it to give him a fair shake. Right. He, can, he can do that. But the point is there, he began to get into screenwriting, began to have a little bit of success, but it really wasn't until he published or got ready to publish uh, Ready Player One as a book. And then there were bidding wars over the publication of the book itself. They began, and then he began to become a superstar. The book was very famous, popular, and then, you know, the rest is history. Spielberg decides to option it, make it into a movie. So it, it was, because I didn't actually know that, it was one of those books kind of like, like when Jurassic Park came out, nobody cared about how good Jurassic Park was. What they knew is that it was a bankable concept, and the studios, I think, before the book was even released, were all bidding for a dinosaur theme park, cloning, Incredible way of bringing dinosaurs back. This is just who cares if the book's any good. What it is 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 this is a cool tagline to put on a movie poster, and the idea sells itself. And so we're all basically sp- spending millions of dollars fighting each other for an idea. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what he saw, and people were fighting for this screenplay. And now, from my what, what I understand, like Universal Studios pretty much immediately said yes to making Armada into a movie. And really? he's, he's going to be a really successful guy because I'm sure this money, this movie is going to make all sorts of money. Um, it's very expensive, looks expensive. I'm sure the movie's going to be fun. Yeah, we'll see. We're watching it um, as a bookening and we'll be talking about I mean, as people it. know, I have the one 80s thing that I do have strong ties to is I, I love Spielberg. Mm-hmm. I do like Spielberg quite a bit. So When he wrote Ready Player One, he had the idea of pop cult- the pop culture of his life as the ancient mythology in his Indiana Jones story. And apparently the main character, the guy, he's actually based on a, an actual dude named Richard Garriott, who is kind of an eccentric guy, went to outer space, purchased a ticket on one of those SpaceX rockets. Not Wade Watts, but the no, Willy Wonka guy. No, the Willy Wonka guy. guy. I forget his name. Right. But yeah, so that character, he's actually based on a real life character that uh, this guy admires. So that's Ernest Klein. Friends with guys like Kevin Smith. James Halliday. James, James Halliday. Halliday. Well... So should we talk about sci-fi? Will it help anybody? Let's talk about sci-fi. Yeah, we should Let's totally talk about, talk about sci-fi. sci-fi. I mean, we just did A Wrinkle in Time. That's sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. So one uh, thing I did not know we, is that... We talked about sci-fi a little bit with Ray Bradbury, too, because... A little bit, yeah. He was, he's was he been classified as sci-fi. And he hated the fact that he was classified. But he hated so, that, yeah. Right. What we're not really going to talk about is kind of the 20s and 30s, 40s radio sci-fi, small magazine sci-fi that we talked about with Ray Bradbury. Mm-hmm. 
because all that people can go back and listen to that episode, and it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Everybody's familiar with the story. The comic books, the radio plays, all these things that became science fiction as we know it in the 50s that became the Twilight Zone that then became Star Trek, and, all, and then finally Star Trek became... Star Wars. I had this book, and it actually was very helpful. I just stumbled across a posset. Uh, a, a posset. You stumbled a posset, huh? I, stu- I stumbled a posset. I stumbled upon it. <laughs> mm. Science fiction uh, before 1900. And this guy, he really knows what he's talking about. He's some professor from University of Southern California and had some helpful things to say about what science fiction is. Mm-hmm. One thing I didn't know is that the actual term science fiction wasn't coined until 1851. Really? And the first time it was ever coined was in some obscure text by William Wilson called A Little Earnest Book Upon a Great Old Subject. And then after that, it really wasn't used again until this guy in 1929 named Hugo Gernsback reinvented it for his magazine Amazing Stories. There you go. And so people like H.G. Uh, Wells, they wouldn't have actually used the term science fiction. They would have been like scientification of literature and stuff is what they would have been talking about, or technology and literature. And so the idea that we have, the concept of sci-fi, wasn't really solidified until 1929. And so one of the points he makes is that we often, we get to this point where we have sci-fi as we imagine it, and then we'll reread back onto the past our ideas about sci-fi. So H.G. Wells would not have had the same ideas of sci-fi that we do. His idea of sci-fi would have been <clears throat> not so much even accurate accuracy with science. In fact, there was a famous debate between Verne and H.G. Wells, Jules Verne. Jules Verne's complaint was that um, he actually used physics. He right. used real science in his work. While H.G. Wells would make this metal machine that could fly to the moon, but then Verne's complaint was, but what kind of metal did he use? Right. And how did it get to the moon? And so this gets us to where um, he thinks, this guy, that the real strength of science fiction is not so much to construct scientific realities as to afford a unique vantage point considering the human condition. Mm -hmm. Which would be why you would classify Bradbury as sci-fi. Which is why you would classify Bradbury as sci-fi. And actually is probably, if I had to make the strongest point for Ready Player One, it does have an interesting vantage point for viewing the human condition. I mean, everybody's talking about global warming and virtual reality and gaming as a real thing. Do I think it could have been done better? We'll find out. (laughs) (laughs) But I do think the premise and the idea isn't a bad one. Mm -hmm. I do think it fits into the category of what makes good sci-fi. He talks a lot about the first, what he calls the first sci-fi text, which a lot apparently, a lot of critics are now beginning to see this as the first sci-fi text, the true, truest sci-fi text, which is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so we'll be reading a lot of sci-fi this year. So this will actually be in conversation with our episode that will be coming up, which we may or may not like that book to either. So <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shelley was governed, he says, by this conviction that the best science fiction has more often than not given powerful imaginative shape to those characteristically modern fears and hopes generated by the creative, as well as the destructive potentials of advanced technology. It's a lot of words. He is a professor. What he's saying is that sci-fi goes hand in hand with a world that is quickly changing because of technology. And if you think about it with Shelley, Mary Shelley, she was right at that point where they still had carriages. I mean, she was, we talked about it with the Jane Austen episode. She was writing when Jane Austen was alive. Right. But also then you had all these really rapid changes happening in science. So then by the time you get to H.G. Wells, things were changing even quicker. And then by the time you get to us, things have just taken this astronomical leap to where we're closer to the singularity than we've ever been. Right. (laughs) Closer to the singularity than we've ever been. And now we're even closer. (laughs) Yeah. And now we're even closer. (laughs) And now they might be giants. 80s band. We're closer to the singularity. And now we're even closer. And now we're even closer. I just want to spring, uh, jump off of what you said real quick to say... You can, you can haggle about what terminology to use all day, but there really are different schools of, sci- of science fiction. There is the hard, hardware-based, what kind of metal would we use to make it to Mars kind of science fiction, which is a lot of what the magazine stuff that Ray Bradbury didn't so much want to be associated with, but that he was published in quite a bit. The early, you know, the 1930s astounding stories kinds of stuff would a lot of times be a lot of techno babble and more Star Trek, more what people think of as the original Star Trek, the, yeah. how, you know, how to, what what H.G. Wells wasn't interested in, but what Jules Verne was, which is what would it, what's a credi- credible version of the future. Jake and I were just talking about how cool the movie Minority Report is because it actually shaped the future. It shaped the future. It shaped and, the world that we live in now. And yeah. predicted. Very much. And you can find, if you go 
probably you've seen all kinds of articles out there about what's cool, what's good, what's bad about how Minority Report shaped the way we think and the way we wanted our user interfaces to be, the way we interface with technology. But everything becoming touch and voice automated and especially the cool swipey stuff. And you find really good articles about why that's been bad and been something of a setback. One way or another, Minority Report is very responsible for things like uh, the iPhone. Yeah, and, the swipey, uh, voice-activated world that we live in yeah. Yeah. today. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a school of sci-fi. And then there's the school of what H.G. Wells represents. It's almost like you've got Vern, on, Vern as the, guy, the father of one and Wells as the father of the other. Vern is the father of the hardware. You know, Vern like predicted the submarine and stuff like that. And then you've got people like Ray Bradbury, people like H.G. Wells, who are just really just fantasists whose stories happen to involve fantastic hardware. But they're, they're just telling... Well, they see technology as presenting, like Brandon or this professor said, uh, a, a possibility to ha- to give you a very different vantage point, a very different yeah. way, a very fresh take. But it's a way so of looking suddenly, at the problems of today. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So technology gives you the ability to imagine a way to the moon or a way to another planet, which allows you to look at the problems of today from right. a fresh, fresh perspective. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, so I think the best, the best sci-fi is really, like, the, the point to reading Ready Player One, if there is any commentary in it, I would say what's good about it is not so much that you get to think, like, what will happen 50 years, but that you think... What ha- what is happening now with Facebook, with Twitter, with eh, I don't with care. the increased uh, increasing dig- digital immersion of right. I, like I don't care for Black lives. Mirror at all. I think it's really stupid and obvious, and I don't recommend that anybody watch. But it's always like this is what the future is going to be like. But it's always just like people in the future are tethered to their phones and are playing games to become more popular online. What a crazy future that would be. And it's like, yeah, I, that oh, would be really horrible. might there be some social satire in this? Thanks, Black Mirror, for your sophisticated social satire. Anyway, I'm sorry we said we weren't going to do cheap shots, and Brandon's eager to get on with his context, but... This is good. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brandon, go on. No, you guys actually are touching on a lot of what this guy is talking about. To, to Jake's point, he talks a lot about the process of defamiliarization in science fiction. All that means is that science fiction is supposed to defamiliarize yourself with your world mm-hmm. by offering you this other world. So then, therefore, you can actually rethink your world, look at it in a different way, a different light. So think about, for example, um, the hideous strength. Mm-hmm. There was a certain defamiliarization going on there with all the animals, the way that they, Mr. Bultitude. Mr. Bultitude. <laughs> yeah, but then also. We finally are understanding the purpose yeah. behind Mr. Bultitude. But the, the nice institute, all these things. Mm-hmm. But then they also help you because they're so unfamiliar. They also then help you understand the problems. Uh, it's not different than uh, than a fairy tale. It's just exactly. a different set of rules. Yeah. Fairy tales are fantastical, magical rules, and sci-fi are whatever scientific rules you can create. But they're mm-hmm. basically magic. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the difference is, and with what Shelley actually Pierce Bish Shelley mm-hmm. is it Bish or Bishy? I don't know how to say his middle Bishy. name. Bishy. Let's say Bishy. Her husband, he wrote the introduction, even though people think Mary wrote it. He mm. actually, most people think he ghost wrote it for her. And his argument there is that... Um, Sexist. Yeah, <laughs> bro, yeah, it is. He probably wrote it, too, just <laughs> like uh, Truman Capote wrote, To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> right. um, so... That's so I'm sorry, now I've just written really um, He made the point where they weren't just writing merely supernatural fancies mm-hmm. in this book. What that shows is that from the beginning, science fiction is opposing itself to the supernatural elements of like the gothic fairy, the gothic romance, the gothic fairy tale. Right, but I want to say, um, and I'm sorry, I hope this doesn't undermine anything you're trying to say. I think a lot of that opposition is in name only and is complete yeah. bunk. We'll talk about it with Frankenstein. But that's, that's she a, doesn't give any scientific... Exactly. Like Jules Verne would be like, uh, how did you bring those corpses back to life, Mary? Uh, what did you... Uh, did you have any... You know, she... Frankenstein goes into his lab, he does some voodoo, and he brings a monster yeah. back to life. It's complete fantasy. But what they're t- attempting to do is strip it of the supernatural. Right. So they still want it to be able to be metaphor and stuff. So it doesn't have to necessarily be real. Right. Right. You don't have to necessarily understand how the science works. In some ways, they're just adapting the fairy tale to modern conceits. Right. Yeah. Instead of right. saying That's a fairy all. wave your magic wand. People don't believe in fairies saying... anymore, but they do believe in science, yes. which is its own kind of magic. And so let's do, ma- you know, if we call it science, then it can be magic that still nobody understands because nobody yeah. understands capital S science, but... Yeah, apparently there was this guy named Felix Bodine. 
Mm -hmm. He was a French guy. He wrote the novel of the future, which was kind of the text everybody used at that time to talk about science fiction. This was back in like 1850. Hmm. And he wanted to find, he said, you need to find the marvelous that is possible in the future right. in technology. And so you look at technology, but in technology, you're looking for the, the marvelous. The thing that, it, it's very similar to what we were talking about with the romantics looking for the sublime. You look for that thing that can transcend, but doesn't have to be God, right? It's not God. You're not looking for God. You're looking for how we can see our own transcendence and our own marvelous um, nature in the things that we can make in the world. While, while fairy tales, as C.S. Lewis says in Shadowlands. Right. <laughs> the magic. <laughs> yep. One of C.S. Lewis's great quotes. <laughs> um, it's magic. But yeah, I mean, this guy does say that what they really are getting to, though, is they're wanting to create new myths. That's what I want people to see. It's just they're, they're waving their hands and doing magic either way. It's just what yep. magic you're willing to accept as a reader. So you're not undermining the point at all. Actually, he gets exactly where you were. You were just jumping the gun. I was, I'm jumping you the gun. You were jumping the gun for us. You were pointing the way forward, right. proving that you should be this guy. Right. I'm the way so, lots of... Yeah. So, um, yeah. What they want to do is they want to provide us our new myths in a way that we understand because our world and our technology has completely shaped, changed everything. You know, Shakespeare could not have imagined the world that we have today. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could not have imagined Ernest Klein would have ever existed. You made that statement, Brandon, and you stand by it. I'm here to support you in making that statement. <laughs> that he could not have imagined the iPhone? Shakespeare, yeah. You yeah. know, you said Shakespeare couldn't, and then you kind of looked like you were embarrassed. But I say, be strong. I'm with you, Brandon. Thank you, John. I see the you. subtext. Yeah. I see the nuance. I see the smirk twinkle in your eye. I had this other book, because... So I got into all this, and I was re listening reading this science fiction stuff and trying to find a way to really make myself okay with Ready Player One. So this was early on in my investigation. <laughs> I, I, I consider this like an investigation, right. like like you said, putting this thing on trial, mm -hmm. kind of. But here I was just gathering evidence and I was looking at the thing and I was like, okay, maybe it's science fiction. And so here, if, if this is what science fiction is doing, it's looking to the technology of today, the possibilities of science to create myths for ourselves. It's what he's trying to do. Well, it's weird because... You almost want to say it's it's dystopian, but you don't quite feel like he believes that it's dystopian. Yeah, I don't think he... Th I think he's okay with a virtual reality. Yeah, no, everybody is glad that they have a place to go. And, and apparently the, his next project is going to be the follow-up to this book. Yeah, Ready, Ready Player, Player two, two, baby. Yeah, and so we have that to look forward to. Um, We should do it. So I briefly then, I was like, okay, so this is a lot of references in this book. Is it mm -hmm. fan fiction? It's not really fan fiction. I don't, I mean, though, Ernest Klein wrote a lot of fan fiction. For it to be fan fiction, it had to be set in another world. So that's fair enough, whatever. I did find out an interesting fact that apparently Jane Austen had fanfic writers <laughs> and also the most fanfic uh, literary figure of all time until we got into the era of fan fiction with Star Trek. Do you know who he was? Fanfic literary author of all time. Tolkien? Sherlock Holmes. Oh, of course. Conan Doyle. Yeah, of course. A lot of fanfic on Conan Doyle. Yep, yep, yep. So, anyways, but this is what kind of uh, sent me spiraling when I read this. Ultimately, like any passion, whether fan fiction or football, wine tasting or marathon, so this is supposedly a serious... This is another professor, somebody who teaches students at a college <laughs> what they should like. If it brings joy, if it grows you, who cares what anyone else thinks? Joy is joy. And if it brings us together, it's worthy, whatever form it takes. <laughs> Ready, player one. <laughs> Really? That's really what it... No, she didn't say that. She didn't say Ready Player oh, okay. One. <laughs> That's me adding the Ready Player One. <laughs> Which is why then, to clean my brain, I got an experiment and criticism off the shelf. <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> uh, please refresh our memory. What's... Uh... Well, it's so awful, though, really. In many ways, an experiment and criticism, I wish... It's a very helpful book for understanding why people like really good literature. Now, who wrote ex an experiment? It's C.S. Lewis. Oh, I, thought we were, I thought we were down on C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. But we liked him. Then we decided that last episode that we liked certain of oh, yes. oh, right. Especially right, his right, ones yeah. on literature. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember if we're just stick figures who only like hate or love people. No, we have complicated opinions. What? Yeah. Amazing. We even like Winnie the Pooh. Did some people Don't write? tell anyone. So the problem with this book, I should, I, I got this book when I was like 16. Mm -hmm. Experiment in criticism. Yeah, and I should, it's the, it's the worst book for young Brandon to have ever received because he starts off the first chapter and people are going to hate me for bringing this book into a discussion of Ready Player One, but there's a reason I am. It's called The Few and the Many. Mm -hmm. Right there, you see how much 
<laughs> the problem. Now, Brandon, where did you think of yourself at the time as one of the few, or, or, well, or one of, of the many? Of course, I thought of myself as one of the many. Oh, one of the many. Okay, no. <laughs> just a humble yeah. member of the I was many. Like, yes, I'm one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well both be reading, reading the Outsider, but but the thing uh, is, is this is towards the end of Lewis's life. He's mm-hmm. about to die. He's writing this book. This is 1960. He's got like four years left, right? Doesn't he right. die in 65? Or is it yeah, later than that? 64, 65, somewhere. Yeah, right. so this is like his last musings on just... He died the day that Kennedy yeah. died. Yeah. Whatever, 63, right? Yeah, so this isn't long yeah. that he has left. And the way I see it is it's kind of like his confessions. He's just sitting there. He's thinking through, why does he love things that some other people don't love? What's going on? He says that this is the book I quoted all the time that he admits that, you know, even the great stories share in common that they have to entertain and thrill and all those things. Mm -hmm. It comes from this book. And he also admits that a lot of people who are in the club of the few are bad people. And a a good majority of the people who are in the many are actually noble, good-hearted people. So he's just trying to figure out what's going on. And so I'm bringing this. So I think what this is helpful for is if someone who's older takes it and you realize, okay, all he's really wanting to do is what makes a piece of literature work, right? And that's fair enough. Like, why does Tolstoy work, but Ready Player One (laughs) doesn't? (laughs) What's the in difference? quite the same way. Yeah, in quite I'm the qual- same way. I'll, I'll add the qualifier. Thank you. In quite the same way. <laughs> Why can we call Anna Karenina, Mansfield Park, works of literature? Masterpieces of the human experience. Works fact. of art. Works of art, yes. But I don't think any of us would be tempted to call Ready Player One a work of literature even. We'll see, but I'm, I'm, I have my doubts. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> is it or is it not literature, Brandon? It's not. <laughs> can you read it? I could have comment on that. <laughs> are there words on pages, Brennan, that are discernible? Yeah. <laughs> Brennan's not. <laughs> we are not amused, <laughs> yeah. says Brandon. Well, his basic point, just to kind of summarize it, is that what happens with the way that most people read things and most people take in art and entertainment is they're using it. Think about Agatha Christie. Think about, and most people, and that's a fair one, because I think most people who like Agatha Christie admit that they're kind of using her just to be have some fun, sure. right? So yeah, I don't think we're going to hurt anybody's feelings here, right? Yeah. Christie's Any Agatha not- Christie fans is going to say, yeah. I read Agatha Christie because it's fun. And, yeah. and by the way, as, as nasty as I've been, been about it, the only reason I don't like Agatha Christie is because she's not fun for me. And I fully allow for the fact that she's fun for other people, and that's great. And so most people, when they're – though he says that's how most people just approach art in general. And so they get bored by Tolstoy because they can't really use it in that way. You can't be entertained by it. You get bored by it. It's not going to do the same thing for you. It's not going to entertain. It's not going to have the great events you're looking for. It's not going to have the fast-paced action you're looking for. Or it's not going to just be the solid news that you want from day to day. So he says that most people would just rather read the news or get the gossip on the – what are they called? Twitter? Gossip blogs. The, the, Twitters. The, the Twitters? What the, social the, media. the social medias, right? Yeah. And so we read more words now than people have ever read in their life, but most of it just just social media stuff. That mm. we're garbage reading. goes in. It's garbage. Out the other. And so it's really a difference in how you treat the thing that you're receiving. And so he says that, however, for a great work of art, for a great work of literature, you're asked and this is silly, maybe, you're asked to receive it, Mm -hmm. basically. You're asked to enter into it and basically forget yourself and just enjoy this thing and loving this thing. Mm -hmm. It sounds, maybe it sounds cheesy, but that's actually the experience when I'm really loving Tolstoy, really loving Austin, really loving Shakespeare. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. You're entering into this thing and you're just loving it for what it is, right? Yeah. Never once do you do that with Ready Player One. It's bending you to its will as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. Is, and so I got this out. Like I said, I wanted a palate cleanser. I wanted to be reminded because not ma- not because of Ernest Klein this time, just because this stupid professor had to say something about, you know, all that matters is that the people are grabbing the means of production. She says that. She's all Marxist about it. The people are grabbing the means of production and we're learning to take things. And I'm over in the corner like with Lewis. I'm saying, hey, buddy, I'm, thank you for writing this book because this moron over here is proving your point. Hmm. But she's trying to make it out to be... A virtue. Virtuous, yes. Mm. Which is what the nerds reading Nietzsche and Schopenhauer do, which is what he tries to do with video games when Ready Player One, and which is why Ernest Klein, to borrow the words from Mark Twain, I wish that I could dig up H.G. Wells' shin bone and beat you over the head with it. (laughs) 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 Let's give our baggage. Jake, 
What baggage did you bring to this book, Ready Player One? Well, I uh, didn't know a lot about it, but I did grow up in the 80s. Well, 90s. Yeah. But I don't know. I was born in 84. Ernest Klein was born in 72, so he really grew up in the 80s. He's the In a way that I book. didn't. Because he right. was like 10, and he got to see Star Wars yeah, no, first run. I was run like and... six when the 80s ended. Right. For various reasons, I did hold on to my time in the 80s longer than uh, than most people, but we won't go into that. So I just came to the book with an open hand and looking for some fun. Brandon? Hi. Your baggage. All I knew about this book was that it is going to be a movie made by... Uh, Steven Spielberg. DBS. The great Steven. DBS. That's yeah. all. That's my baggage. What's your favorite? I think we've talked about this on the booking before. What's your favorite Steven Spielberg movie? Uh, Indiana Jones. Which one? Temple of Doom, presumably. Yeah, Temple of Doom. Yeah. Or it's Crystal Skull. Crystal Skull. The other two can take a long walk in the <laughs> sticks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're not an idiot. Jake, your favorite Spielberg movie? So it's hard to top Raiders. I might say, I might say E.T. I'd say it'd be one of those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of childhood nostalgia, though... I don't know that it's really all that great of a movie, but man, Jurassic Park sure does. Oh, I love Jurassic Park. Yeah, no, I would make my top four or five. I have a vague thought that maybe we've had this exact conversation before on the yeah, book. I'm sure we in have. terms of childhood nostalgia, Goonies wins for me. I'm, yeah, but that's like an, a, he executive produced it kind of thing. Yeah, direct, he didn't, that, he didn't direct Goonies? No, Richard Donner sure? directed Goonies. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know I mean, that. it's ambient entertainment. It's got his mark all over yeah, it, yeah, just yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. lots of movies do. Whatever you associate with Spielberg and childhood nostalgia, for me, it's going to be Goonies, but in terms of just being a great movie, E.T. or Raiders. E.T. or Raiders, of course, yes, I would agree. Schindler's List. <laughs> As far as movies that Spielberg have his mark on them, but aren't actually directed by him, I don't want to say like there's three different ones that I just want to bring up here. Back to the Future, it's Back obviously to the future, yeah. kind of a classic. I thought about bringing that one up too. And then none of these other two are, I don't know that either one of them is actually a good movie, but they, man, did they leave an indelible mark in both cases because they were kind of horrifying to me. Gremlins. Poltergeist. Yeah, Poltergeist. Poltergeist was... Awesome. I really loved Poltergeist actually as a kid. I thought it's it was the really only cool. big he didn't pro- he didn't direct no, that he one. he executive produced it and the scuttlebutt is that he actually did direct it. There's a lot of famous there's a lot of mm-hmm. actors that have gone on record saying Stephen came in and just directed this took whole thing and took it over and the guy uh, Toby Hooper got the you know they didn't credit. bother he got the credit but really it was it's just actually is a Spielberg movie. That's okay. what a lot of people say. That's the only Spielberg movie that I can think I haven't I think I haven't seen anyway Gremlins creep me out man Gremlins yeah did you watch it as a kid yeah it's Gremlins is a mean movie especially when the, the <laughs> I won't recount it for our listeners if they don't know it because it is pretty horrifying but the story that Phoebe Cates tells <laughs> in Gremlins really really disturbed me as a kid it really bothered me a lot <laughs> anyway I don't know why I'm talking about this. Oh, well, I guess that's my baggage. I grew up with those things. I love those things. I love Spielberg a lot. I am a generation removed from Atari. I did not know anyone that had an Atari. I don't remember Atari really being a thing. I remember NES being a thing. Yeah, NES was the system I first had. So I feel like this movie, this book, a lot of its references are just a little bit I'm past. Did you grow, did you, uh, grow up going to the arcade, though? I did go to the arcade some. Yeah. Yeah, that's would be my closest point of reference to the kinds of video games that he's talking about here. There was a mall probably five or seven miles from my house. Mm-hmm. We'd bike to it, and there was an arcade there, and we'd play in the arcade. A bunch of young boys on bikes going yep. to the arcade. This mall was sort of nestled on the edge of su- suburbia. There was a bigger mall that was a little more surrounded by, you know what you think of? Yeah. Uh, city. City proper, maybe. Well, I don't know. Is there any more baggage we should talk about? I guess for me, the whole idea of being nostalgic for a video game is kind of weird. Like, I don't really get it. I understand that. I guess I'm kind of nostalgic just for that certain time in my life, like playing Mario with my brothers. But it's all connected to sets of friends and people. As far as the video game itself... I don't know how like nostalgic I am for that specifically. I mean, I'm nostalgic for sleepovers, playing Smash Brothers or whatever it was we were doing. You know, I had a lot, I've had a lot of fun in my life, especially my earlier life playing video games, but actually having some kind of connection to the thing itself is a little weird for me. When I think of video games, I think of or video games I might have some nostalgia for. I think of the NES that we had when my parents were still together and playing that at my great grandmother's house. And then, and so that's Super Mario and Duck Hunt and the track and field game. And then I think of 
basically my mom's house. She got my aunt Teresa and uncle Mike always had a great gaming, the, the newest top of the line gaming system. And so I remember going over there and playing video games with him and my brother. And then my mom always got his hand-me-down whenever he upgraded for us. And so, you know, sort of playing like the last generation <laughs> games yes. behind everybody else. So I do, I also, you know, the sleepover, playing Golden Eye with friends. I, you know, well, you actually just triggered like, 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 uh, what is it? What was it that is it Proust? Is that how you say his name? Proust. Yeah, like the melon. Yeah, like the melon. Jake just triggered a memory for me, which I that I do actually have nostalgia, which was going to my grandpa. Nineveh, they had a house on the lake on Lake Nineveh, and so you could go fishing down at the lake, or you could the the fun thing that he had in his den was one of those little TVs that you actually have to turn the knob and it into life and it was hooked up to an NES and grandma for whatever reason was really good at it and she she could like beat Milan's secret castle and some of those huh. some of those early games Mario and stuff like that so there's a strong association with my grandparents there yeah. huh. my grandpa upgraded every time like he was just kind of a tech geek so he would upgrade each t- each time there was a new system and, but he could never he couldn't make the leap into 3D when the 64 came out he bought it and he was looking forward to it and then his brain just couldn't wrap his head around walking around in a 3D yeah. environment he couldn't do it and so I think he eventually probably gave it to us or got rid of it or I don't know what he did what are your early video game memories Brandon pretty similar we had a NES growing up played a lot of Mario with my dad and my brother my grandparents had a Super Nintendo when that finally came out. Mm-hmm. We played a lot of Mario Kart. And my dad's parents actually did have an Atari. So we would play old Atari games at their house. So they had like some sort of jungle game where you had to try and jump over a pit mm-hmm. on vines and stuff. They had Space Invaders and they had the one, the famous one, the tennis one. Mm-hmm. Pong. So, Pong. Yeah. I mean, we play that. I have a lot of, it's, but it's more of the whole atmosphere. Right. Yeah. yeah playing the game. It's not the game itself. It's the associations that come with yeah. it. Yeah, I never was exactly. big into video games. So that would go through phases where I would play for a while, but it never gripped me. I remember we, I, we were never allowed to have a subscription to it, but I did like looking through Nintendo Power Magazine and some of they'd have these really evocative pictures of the world of Hyrule or whatever. So that sort of resonated with me in the book when he gets into... I think one of the challenges is he has to remember the cover of some Dungeons and Dragons manual or something like that. Just the idea that someone would have in their head as part of the minutia of pop culture kind of memory, a specific cover where yeah. a guy is standing outside of a dungeon and there's a demon or whatever it is. I do have those kinds of things filed away in my brain, just covers of magazines or advertisements even that I just thought were really cool. So yeah. Closest thing I had to that was... I may have gotten a magazine, a Mortal Kombat magazine or something like that because my friends and I were in the Mortal Kombat and you wanted to know all the cool finishing moves and stuff like that. Never really got beyond that. Well, there we go. Never so so all that to say, none of us huge video game guys, we might be in some sense the wrong audience for this book. Yeah, I didn't have a gaming system in college. Even you know, most everybody I know had gaming systems in college, and they played Halo and stuff. Yeah, same here. I never, my, I still don't know how to do Halo. I think maybe I talked about this somewhere in the Warhorn verse not too long ago, but I still don't know my fingers. I mean, I can do it, but I'm no good at it. Like I never made the leap past side scrollers. Like my my, I'm just not trained in mm-hmm. that. So. And I feel stupid. Like my, feel out of the loop. Yeah, my brothers. If we played anything today, they they could pick up a controller of a system they'd never played before, and they would just naturally. They're both younger than me. They'd just naturally be able to do it a lot better than I would be able to do it at this point. Yeah. I do. I do feel. I've always felt old and out of it when it comes to video games in particular. I've been savvy about other pop cultural things in my lifetime, but not ever video games. I've always been out of the loop on those. Not Ernest Klein. No, not Ernest Klein. Well, not Wade Watts. Not Wade Watts. Well, folks, we're just about out of time. Well, we're going to be back next week All right. for the trial of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Nuremberg drug trials were last century. This century, OJ and Nuremberg, what are the other famous trials? Uh, uh, the uh, What's the Darwin? Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, what is the Darwin one called? Something of the monkey. No, it's the Scopes trials. Scopes trials. Yeah, yeah the Scopes, Scopes trials. trials. That was all last century. This century, we have... Chastine versus Menzel? Chastine versus Klein? Going down, man. (laughs) For the defense. I, I am the attorney appointed by the state.
Yep, Whoa. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> By the state of good times. <laughs> and great oldies. <laughs> <laughs> and for the mean, crusty, suit wearing. That's right. Uh, uh, internet White seizing, lab coat, lab coat wearing, internalized yeah. racist, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Hazmat suit owning, yeah, white yeah. van driving, white van yeah. driving. That's right. Name badge wearing, little yeah. telekinetic girl manipulating yeah. jerks. It's me. <laughs> We've got Brandon, <laughs> and I. I'm just your humble and obedient judge, or that's what I'll be next week. Uh huh. <laughs> Hey, Spaghetti Day was written and produced by Nathan Alberson. It was executive produced by Nathan Alberson and Jacob Menzel. It featured the fine contextual work of one of the few, <laughs> Brandon Chastine. Oh, boy. And <laughs> we've got Jacob Menzel yep. eh, among the many. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Just stick me among the many, buddy. Yeah, me too. We're, we're over here. We just, we're just like, hey, let's read uh, some... B- crap to make ourselves feel better about our stupid lives. And Brandon's like, no, <laughs> you can't have anything to feel better about your stupid life. It has to be a great work of art. I will let the literature improve me. <laughs> <laughs> Homeschool, MFA, mm-hmm. wannabe, oh, piano PhD playing, wannabe. <laughs> This hurts, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how we'll see who wins next week. Join us next week, folks. 